Okay, good afternoon, everybody. So I, I need to use a sporting term. I'm Frank Nocton. I need to introduce you to a sporting term. It's called called in off the bench. Uh, yes. You know what it means? Okay. What called in off the bench means is one of the key players gets injured in a match and you call in someone off the bench, one of the subs. So I wasn't called in off the bench. I was actually in the crowd yesterday. <laughs> you know? And Ailish rang me and she said, did you bring your boots? I said, I have boots. She said, you're on. <laughs> so here I am. So that's just by way of excusing what I, the quality of what I do. Okay, so I was asked to read and comment on uh, no, community, no Commons Without a Community by Maria Mies. So I, I have an involvement in community development and community education, which is very small scale and very low key and low tech and so on. And I respond out of that to it. And I'm also a man, you know, getting on a wee bit. And I'm also a carer. So I respond out of all those identities to what I, I read. The first thing uh, is that when it comes... I like theory and ideas. But when it comes to them, I have a kind of a continuum. And at one end of the continuum is stilettos, which are elegant. I never wear them, but they're elegant. <laughs> they're... Intricate, they're a bit brittle, you know, they look well, perhaps, in certain circumstances. And at the other end are walking boots. So I'm a kind of a walking boots person myself. I tend to go towards that end of the theory. I want something serviceable that will get me through difficult days. So when I read this, I felt I was in good territory, that this woman has lived through things and she's done things and she sinks. The heart of her article is in the title, that's no commons without a community. Now what Eilish asked me to do is summarise it and respond, but I have no intention of doing that, because <laughs> I found that too difficult. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you what sense I've made of the article from my perspective, because I assume everyone has read it. So at the heart of it is that there's no commons without a community. So I want to put three things out. So there's a commons, a community, and the third thing is there is care or commitment. Her argument for me is you can't have a commons without a community, a community, not community in a vague sense, a community, a specific group of people who are minding it, but they care and they're committed to it. So within this, it's a kind of a virtuous triangle that if you have a community who care for it, then it returns things to the community. And what I find really interesting in what she says is that in historical terms, the commons People did not participate in the commons because they thought it was a great idea. They participated because there was no other way of living. So you had to survive. So you, you were part of the commons because that's how you survived. So from my own experience, and I look at the commons, I, I'm really new to this. I'm just off out from the audience or from the spectators. My experiences are different. And the commons isn't the language I would use. But if I look at my own experience through a commons lens, what I notice is that the people I find who are most committed, they do it because there won't be a life if they don't do it. They know they need it. I kept thinking of the Flannery O'Connor short story with the title, um, The Life You Save May Be Your Own. So there's this sense, there's an urgency about this for people. They have to do it either because economically they need to do it or else it might be that they have a compulsion. They want to live in a way that does that. So that's at the heart of her argument. Those three things are necessary. So it isn't the weekend um, away to do commons work. Um, she talks a bit about her childhood in the Rhineland and taking care of common areas, the ponds and the land and the pathways. And as I read it, what struck me was, and I borrowed this from someone else, what struck me was that participation in the community, caring, committed to the commons, gave three things. 
One was security. That people had a certain level of economic and even psychological security. The second thing it gave was solidarity. They were part of something, working with others. And the third thing was significance. Everybody had a role to play. Everybody had a part. So as she describes her childhood experiences, all of these things are present. Now what's interesting is, she talks more about caring for the commons than caring for the community. And I suppose from my own experience, Communities need to care for themselves because some of the greatest wounds that people inflict are on their own. It's not the outsider, it's the insiders doing things to one another, which cause a lot of pain. So she might have, you know, I'm just saying that's an, an angle that might need some attention. The commons were enclosed, not by the insiders, she argues, but by outsiders, by landlords and by capitalists who, need, who wanted profit and so on. So that's her argument. She moves on to give two examples of enclosure and resistance, one in Papua New Guinea and one in uh, India, and the neem tree in India when a company tried to patent the neem tree, and people resisted it. The first example about the land use in Papua New Guinea I find really interesting because I was just thinking, she used all these acronyms, you know, GATT, and the World Bank, WB, and the Free Trade Agreement, all these. So I, as I read all these acronyms for all these organizations, I, I couldn't but think, maybe they need a mega acronym, like a crowd of S-H-I-T-S, <laughs> but that's what you're left with, you know, that, that all these groups are plundering, really. But what was interesting was, in the case of Papua New Guinea, the Prime Minister said, we beggars can't be choosers, we need this intervention. And the people said, we don't want to be beggars in our own land, which probably resonates with a lot of us here in Ireland at the moment. It seems to me what was offered to the people was a spurious form of security, but at the expense of their solidarity and significance. In other words, all of that system was done away with for a spurious um, security. So I've been part of a community development program in Ireland, and my experience of that program is one of enclosure that a program which had lots of common elements or commoner elements in the beginning with communities doing things and then getting some support has gradually moved from that commons-like existence to enclosure with the state enclosing it and removing, offering a spurious form of security in some funding but removing solidarity and removing significance, removing all the good bits. When I read it, and in terms of the Papua New Guinea example and, and uh, my own experience, uh, in um, the early part of the 20th century, the Mona Lisa was stolen from the Louvre by Vincenzo Perugia, who was Italian, who really thought it belonged in Italy. So after it was stolen, the day after and the next day and the next day after that, more people came to see where the Mona Lisa had been <laughs> than had actually come to see the Mona Lisa. So, I've actually explored this with different communities and groups, and what I often find is, I ask them about their Mona Lisas, and oftentimes their Mona Lisas are gone. And what's often gone is experiences of the commons, that that's the bit that goes, and it's only when it's gone that people say, oh God, how did we let that go? So sometimes it seems to me that the actual experience of the commons is only something people recognize in retrospect when they look at it afterwards. She moves on to the internet and talks about whether the internet is a commons or not. I was saying to Eilish, I'm a person, in terms of the internet, I'm friendless. <laughs> I'm untweeted. <laughs> I'm not LinkedIn, you know. So I'm probably, and I have a real sympathy with the Luddite movement. I understood their principles <laughs> and what they were at, and I think they get a bad press. <laughs> So I may not be the best person to talk about this, but she argues that she makes a whole pile of arguments why the internet is actually a commons. You know, it aids democracy, it spreads information, but the best bit is the but, the bit after the but. So I'll skip all the reasons why it is. When she gets to the but, she's arguing that it's not 
it's not open to everybody, it's controlled by a few companies, that the minerals which are used for the computers are taken from the earth, from Mother Earth. There's a cost that the people who extract them, they get lousy wages, so there's a huge cost. And she has a whole series of doubts about the level of connectivity between people on, on the internet. In my simple way of thinking about it, it seemed to me she thinks the internet is high tech but low touch. People are not in touch with one another in a serious way. And she has a lot of time for touch and being connected and physical connection. She says mat mat the last two words in the thing are matter matters. So that sort of level of, so she's arguing and she goes back again to her childhood. She goes back and says, that at that time, in a way, the technology was present, it was appropriate, but there was high touch. So that's her concern about the internet. Overall, I liked it, I enjoyed it, I found it really evocative. I leave you with two images. Uh, I'm, I'm engaged in caring, and there's a woman called Nell Noddings, an American philosopher who's written a lot about caring. She distinguishes between caring for and caring about. Caring for is the day-to-day, hands-on, tender, loving care, looking after things, minding things, making sure things go right. Caring about, when she originally thought about it, was a kind of an undifferentiated concern. I care a lot about democracy. That's great. Or I care a lot about the environment. That's great. But over time, she's changed her mind. And she says, we need caring for and we need caring about. What caring for gives us is depth, a commons, a community, and care. A specific one in a particular place and time with a group of people, not an intellectual pursuit. What caring about gives us is a bit of breath. It invites us to go a bit beyond. So both of those, it seems to me, are important. And I think at the heart of the <coughs> article, both of them are there. Uh, as I was reading it, I found it very evocative. I was saying in the group here, I went back to read a poem by Cahal O'Sharkey, the Donegal poet, a poem called On Tubber, The Well, where he talks about the well in the valley in where he was born and how people had let the wells go. Everybody looked after the wells and they had fresh water. And then what happened was the piped water came in, which he describes as zestless, lusterless slops. But he says, we must go back. We must go back to the sources. We must go back to it. But the sad part in the poem, in a way, is that people have not only lost the water, but they've lost the way of tending for the water. So I see her article as an invitation to engage in those activities again, perhaps in a new way. Okay.